be sure to follow my ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Links are in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tony Perkins is the president of the Family Research Council. He joins us now for more. Tony, we repeatedly see and hear messages of unity coming from the pre uh, President Biden, difficult in today's climate. In what ways or areas do you see unity achievable if the Biden administration reached out to you and said, we want to work on this together? I agree with something that uh, the president said. He said, unity and healing must begin with understanding uh, and not lies. And, you know, I, I agree with him. He, in that statement, but he did that as he was uh, abolishing the 1776 Commission. Look, I, I think first off, uh, if they truly want lib uh, unity in this country, which we desperately need, then they have to stop being the party that is silencing the opposition. Uh, they have to stop being the party that denies science and is forcing transgenderism on our children in elementary schools and on our nation's military. We've got to start with facts and truth. And the truth is, they don't want a diverse, a truly diverse cabinet that would include all of America, maybe half of the Democratic Party, but certainly not conservatives, evangelicals, those that believe in traditional values. Uh, the message is they're not welcome in this administration. Tony, President Biden is going very hard on these executive orders. What ones stand out to you the most so far? Well, it's quite interesting how the media has a double standard, um, present company excluded. When you look back four years ago, uh, Donald Trump had not even done uh, a, a quarter of the executive orders that we're already seeing from Joe Biden. In fact, it appears Joe Biden has already will soon surpass the, uh, the same mark that uh, Donald Trump did in 100 days, in his first 100 days. And the media was decrying uh, Donald Trump as a tyrant, you know, ruling by executive order when he actually had both houses of Congress under Republican control. Joe Biden has both houses under Democratic control, but yet he is using the executive pen uh, in a way that no previous president has done. So I, first off, I think where, what he's doing in our public schools, transgenderism, pushing this radical agenda that, that uh, Americans have rejected. Uh, look what he's done to the military. Donald Trump, based upon facts, a study by General Mattis that showed that uh, this was harmful to our nation's national security. He undid that with a pen yesterday. Uh, mm. I mean, it's it, not, not only that, but look how he's attacked jobs. Uh, with canceling the Keystone Pipeline. It took four years to get us to a point of being energy independent, which is a national security issue, all that undone by Joe Biden with a pen. Tony, many of these orders center on issues considered central to the church, like refugees and racial justice. Do you see much room for support from the evangelical world here? I do think that there, there has to be a way forward on the immigration issue, um, but it's been something that's been wrestled with for 20 years. I've been uh, at this post nearly 20 years. And we came, we've come close a couple of times, and I think it, it has to be a balanced approach. I do not see what uh, Joe Biden is pursuing as a balanced approach. Uh, I, I think you, you cannot take 11 uh, million people who are here illegally and award uh, them with, uh, with, with citizenship. Um, and I think stopping the border wall, the security, uh, that Americans want is the wrong approach to dealing with the issue. There is a way forward, but Joe Biden is not pursuing that way. Tony, you touched on it. The president's new executive order on gender identity says kids in public schools should be able to enter whatever bathroom or locker room they choose based on their gender identity. And uh, that boys who identify as girls should be able to participate in girls' sports. What does this mean, Tony, for school districts that disagree? Well, Jenna, there's not going to be much room for disagreement under this administration. I think I think part of the show of force here in our nation's capital right now with uh, the military, given the fact that, you know, Portland and cities like that continue to smolder 
uh, and they're still having rioting there, but you don't see the, the National Guard moving in on those cities. Look, this is a show of force. This is about showing who's in control and that dissent is punished. But here's what has to happen, Jenna. I, I think that Christians in America need, number one, need to be praying. And we need to pray for Joe Biden. I've been praying for him, praying that he would make the right decisions that will be beneficial to all America. But I also pray that confusion would descend upon those who deny truth. And so far, we're seeing a lot of that in this administration. Look, Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 says, Have you not read from the beginning that God created them male and female? Look, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, the Word of God is quite clear on the issue of human sexuality. I know there's some abnormalities, uh, but those are rare, few, and far between. We're talking about policy. We're creating policy here that right. is going to confuse our children and lead them down a destructive path. It's wrong. It must be resisted. But I also pray that confusion would descend upon those who deny truth. Is there such a thing as absolute truth? The unsaved hold the view there is no right or wrong. Therefore, whatever feels or seems right at the time and in that situation is right. Christians hold the view that there are indeed absolute realities and standards that define what is true and what is not. To the unsaved, tolerance has become the one cardinal virtue of the postmodern society the one absolute, and therefore, intolerance is the only evil. Any dogmatic belief, especially a belief in absolute truth, is viewed as intolerance, the ultimate sin to an unbeliever. If there is absolute truth, then there are absolute standards of right and wrong, and we are accountable to those standards. This accountability is what people are really rejecting when they reject absolute truth. The denial of absolute truth and the cultural relativism that comes with it are the logical result of a society that has embraced the theory of evolution as the explanation for life. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning, we have no purpose, and there cannot be any absolute right or wrong. Man is then free to live as he pleases and is accountable to no one for his actions. Yet, no matter how much sinful men deny the existence of God and absolute truth, they still will someday stand before God in judgment. The Bible declares this in Romans 1, 19 through 22. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Is there any evidence for the existence of absolute truth? Yes, there is the human conscience, that certain something within us that tells us the world should be a certain way, that some things are right and some things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us there is something wrong with suffering, pain, and evil, and it makes us aware that love, generosity, compassion, and peace are positive things for which we should strive. The Bible describes the role of the human conscience as we read in Romans 2, 14 through 16. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has revealed his truth to us through his word, the Bible. Knowing absolute truth is only possible through a personal relationship with the one who claims to be the truth, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life, and the only path to God. The fact that absolute truth does exist points us to the truth that there is a sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth and who has revealed himself to mankind in order that we might know him personally through his Son, Jesus Christ. That is the absolute truth. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. From powerful winds to torrential rain and packed snow, California once again is getting pummeled. 17 million people under flash flood watches. Statewide, nearly 300,000 are still without power. Meanwhile, parts of the Sierra Nevada could see up to 10 feet of snow. And in the Santa Cruz Mountains, thousands are under evacuation. I've been here 15 years. It's probably the worst it's been ever. An atmospheric river is driving this nasty weather. It's a concentrated ribbon of moisture in the sky that can move water vapor faster than the Mississippi River. Turning now to that wild weather across the country, dangerous mudslides and flash flooding slamming California, and even avalanche danger threatening the West. Will Carr is in Santa Cruz, California with the latest on all of that. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Then after a record setting wildfire season, Californians have been hoping for rain, but this has been like turning a shower head on full blast. We've gotten so much rain so quickly. You can see it's brought mud all the way down through this driveway. Now this area is under evacuation, but a lot of residents decided to stay and fight. They have been working throughout the night. You can see what they've done to fortify their properties. They've lined them with these sandbags. The real concern though is not just the mud. It's everything that comes with it, including rocks, boulders like like this and trees that could come flowing down and damage their properties. Overnight, that atmospheric river flowing over the West Coast. You didn't even see that, dude. Rains flooding parts of California, washing mud from fresh burn scars downhill, slamming sludge into nearly two dozen homes, injuring at least one person. Husband was pulling her out of the house and broke her arm, getting her out of the house as mud was flowing into the front door. The rain relentless. Some parts of Northern California will get up to 10 inches by the end of the day. Rain has been pounding this area and you can see that it has turned this into a river of mud and crews right now are doing everything they can. They're clearing out this street to protect all of the homes. How dangerous of a situation is this right now? It's one of those where we're preparing for the worst. California's mountains blanketed with blizzard conditions. These tractor trailers using a police escort to slowly creep off the interstate. And that UPS truck stuck, towed back on the road. This pickup barreling down a snow-covered road, losing control. Slamming into that red truck, and then another. And in the east, we got a tornado warning. A tornado touching down in Tallahassee. Children and their teachers seen ducking, taking shelter in a school hallway. The damaging winds flipping this plane and temporarily closing the airport. Millions of Californians could see flash flooding today, and we could also get up to seven more inches of rain by the time this is all over. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means literally a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, 
will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. It's a life or death drama at a hotel in Phoenix. We've got an irate guest of another guest here running around with a gun here. Yeah, he's beating up on his old lady. The hotel guest runs off with his baby. Then his desperate wife calls police. My husband just took my baby. He has a gun. He's loaded. He took the baby. He's trying to kill him. He's shooting me fire. He's going to kill people. He's shooting guns. A witness calls 911. He has a gun and he has a baby in his arms. He is shooting. He's shooting right now. A cop gets there just a minute later. The gunman opens fire. Oh, hey! Drop the gun! Drop the gun, dude! He has a kid hostage right now. He has a gun. He has made one gunshot already. We need more units. Dude, put the kid down, man! Stop! Other cops get there. He's, he's got a gun, man. He's got the kid. When the suspect points the gun at the infant, a police sharpshooter lines up his shot. Everything is riding on this critical moment. The gunman is down, and cops race to find out if the child has been hurt. Get the kid! Get the kid! Come here, buddy! Come on, buddy! Come on! Come on! I got the kid! I got the kid! Are you okay? Hi, man. The gunman, identified by cops as 37-year-old Paul Bolden, was pronounced dead at a Phoenix hospital. Thank goodness, his infant is fine. To an armed hostage standoff at a pediatrician's office in Texas that ended in tragedy. The gunman with terminal cancer killed a doctor, a mother of three, before turning the gun on himself. Marcus Moore has the story. This morning, a city grieving as investigators try to figure out what led to a hostage standoff and murder suicide. Tuesday afternoon, Austin, Texas police officers responded to reports that a man now identified as Dr. Bharat Narumanchi was holding five workers hostage at a pediatric doctor's office. There were no patients or children uh, that were at the uh, building when, when the suspect arrived on scene. Police say Narumanchi had multiple guns when he walked into the building. He displayed a gun and um, told the hostages to tie themselves up. Some of the hostages were able to escape and some of them were ultimately released. The doctor's still inside. The last hostage, 43-year-old Dr. Catherine Lindley Dotson, a mother of three, could not escape. For hours, negotiators tried speaking with Narumanchi, but when SWAT finally entered that building, both doctors were found dead. Our hearts are just in a place that we can't even describe how sad we are. Overnight, members of the community reflecting on Dr. Dotson's impact. As a physician, you're ready to sacrifice your, your life and your time and your talents for people, and that's exactly what she did. She's a true hero. The Dotson family sharing a statement saying, as a dedicated mom, wife, daughter, friend, and pediatrician, she radiated light, love, and joy in everything she did and everyone she touched. Authorities say the 43-year-old suspect, also a pediatrician, had applied to volunteer at Dotson's office about a week before, but was turned down. Investigators also say he was recently diagnosed with terminal cancer and given weeks to live. And investigators believe that cancer diagnosis may have played a role in what happened here, but they simply don't know for sure at this point, George, as this community continues to mourn. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Tonight, one person dead, others injured, a driver in custody after a hit and run rampage in Southeast Portland. And now, our first look at the arrest of the suspect. Several witnesses surround the man, corral him until police arrive, and then police take the man in custody during a struggle on the street. Police say just at one this afternoon, the driver started running down people with his car over more than a dozen blocks, and all of this happening 
west of Laurelhurst Park. You can see many of these areas within this area where they're investigating right there on your screen. The person that was in critical condition has died. Five others rushed to the hospital. The suspect, like you just saw in that video, was arrested. Investigators still on the scene, but they are slowly taking down the police tape. And as you can take a look behind me, the car that was involved in this incident has gone. The a tow truck just took away the car just a few minutes ago. Now, Portland police received multiple calls earlier this afternoon about a car driving erratically, hitting cars and pedestrians. It started near Laurelhurst Park, and sus the suspect crashed here near Southeast 18th and Stark. Police say after the crash, the suspect ran away, but it was people in the community who corralled him, and police were able to arrest him. So again, six people were hit. One of them has died. We spoke with witnesses and Portland police and fire about this chaotic scene. It's just crazy how one person could go on some rampage and how many people did he traumatize? I mean, I have, I was very minor. You know, I got away without a scratch. Teresa Bergen considers herself lucky. Really, it was her quick thinking that kept her safe. She was on her usual run in Laurelhurst Park when she heard a car. At first, she didn't think much of it because occasionally there are maintenance trucks on the pedestrian path. She soon realized at this time that was not the case. The car was about 10 feet behind her, and she says there really wouldn't have been room for both of them on the path, so she ran up an embankment. I felt sort of foolish, like maybe I was overreacting, because you really don't expect a car to ever try to hit you, you know? But um, later on, when I heard about everything that happened, I was really glad I ran up that embankment. If I'd been wearing headphones and listening to music, I probably would have been run over. Portland police are investigating whether or not the suspect's actions were intentional. Lori Geske says it did seem that way when he hit a cyclist on 20th and Belmont. I heard a noise, and that's what made me look over because I thought, what it was that? It wasn't an accident like glass or metal, but he had gone up on the sidewalk and hit the... Belmont Collective sandwich board in an attempt to hit the guy on his bike, which he did. Bergen says she didn't realize the extent of what was happening until she started hearing sirens and then saw one of the victims. It was only when she got home that she realized six people had been hurt and one of them died. I cried a lot. I feel terrible for the people that lost, you know, lost a person they loved, the one woman who died, the many people who were injured. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of wickedness and violence that is sweeping the world today. Jesus tells us when society parallels the days of Noah, he will return as we read in Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was going on in Noah's day that parallels our day? To find out the answer, we need to go back to the book of Genesis 6, 5-13. through 13. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There is no doubt about the hour in which we live being the season for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ as we link Matthew 24, verses 12 and 37 through 39 with 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The Bible describes our day very clearly from these scriptures. The condition of wickedness and violence that caused the earth to be destroyed in Noah's day is the same condition our earth is in today. At an Air Force base in the south of Taiwan, fighter jets practice for an incursion towards the island by military planes from nearby mainland China. Jets have been scrambling for real more often as China has stepped up its military patrols, most recently last weekend. It seems to be Beijing's reminder that it will always regard Taiwan as part of China and it's prepared to take it back by force if necessary. We make no promise to renounce the use of force and reserve the option to use all necessary measures. Our position has been consistent and will not change. 
Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen, inspecting her military's preparedness, says the island is ready for any aggression. From last year, our radar stations have detected incursions by nearly 2,000 Chinese military aircraft and over 400 military vessels. We drove them away in a timely manner and secured our maritime and airspace. Increased activity across the Taiwan Strait comes as the U.S. conducts a so-called freedom of navigation exercise, sending an aircraft carrier group into the nearby South China Sea, angering Beijing, which regards it as largely its own. During the recent turbulent years of the Trump administration, Taiwan has often been caught in the middle of strained relations between China and the U.S and the new Biden administration might not mean an end to that turbulence. I also believe that um, uh, President Trump was right in taking uh, a tougher approach to China. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, the way that he went about it in a number of areas, but the basic principle was the right one. The major players in East Asia geopolitics are embarking on a new era, but bringing with them the same tensions from the last one. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9, and Luke 21 12. Matthew 24 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21 12. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Hi, I'm Bernadette Tacey with Alliance Defending Freedom. Today we are speaking with former professional baseball player and HGTV star David Benham. He is the chairman and president of Cities for Life, an organization dedicated to equipping Christians to protect life. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. It's a true honor. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your organization and what inspired you to start it? Sure. Well, my brother and I, after we got out of pro baseball and started a business at the height of our company, the Lord really laid it on our hearts what are you doing for the least of these in the city and, and we knew that in charlotte north carolina there were three abortion facilities so we felt the lord wanted us to uh bring biography to the theology of luke chapter 10 which is the parable of the good samaritan who didn't walk by on the other side of the person that was robbed beaten and left for dead but actually went down into the ditch and bandaged the wound and placed oil on him, took him to an end paid for him and said i'll follow up so we felt like you know what we need to create a ministry called Cities for Life, and this was in 2010. And so we began to put together a, a, a sidewalk volunteer effort of sidewalk missionaries and counselors that would then counsel these mothers that feel like abortion was their only option, and then plug them into what we called the Life Network, which was a, a life, a, you know, a, a, a network of life-affirming ministries across our city. And next thing you know, it began to grow exponentially, and over 5,000 mothers have chosen life since we started with Cities for Life. And, and then, of course, out of that came Love Life, which was a prayer movement where churches would begin to mobilize and do uh, prayer out at the abortion facility. And then as a result of that, 300 mentor families uh, we've put together. And so when a mother chooses life with the Cities for Life sidewalk counselors, they then get plugged into the Love Life mentor network. And it has been amazing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Now, we do want to hear about your case. So back in April of 2020, police cited and arrested members of both Cities for Life and Love Life for engaging in peaceful prayer and sidewalk counseling just outside of abortion facilities in Charlotte. So can you tell us what happened? Yeah, well, I, I was enjoying a, a rather peaceful Saturday morning. Uh, the governor had just uh, made an ordinance or a proclamation that because of COVID, um, that uh, there were only certain businesses that were essential. 
and abortion clinics were considered essential. And inside the provisions or inside the ordinance was several provisions for nonprofit ministries. And ours is a 501c3 federally recognized uh, public nonprofit. And so we fell within those guidelines. So we continue to do sidewalk counseling, but we went a step further. We only pared down to three sidewalk counselors and kept them socially distanced and had hand sanitizer. So on that Saturday morning, uh, I was drinking coffee with my wife and I get a phone call from a friend saying, hey, there's a whole bunch of police officers down at the abortion facility. They're threatening to make arrests to the Cities for Life sidewalk counselors and to the, some of the love life people that are praying. And I was like, what, how could that happen? So I went down there and as soon as I got out of my truck, I looked, I looked to the left where the abortion facility was and I saw three of our sidewalk counselors who were clearly socially distant and I saw down the street, not even in front of the abortion facility, a couple people that were praying. And that was it. And outside of that, it was like 12 to 15 officers. And so as soon as I got out of my truck, the officer said, Mr. Benham, you need to leave. They knew exactly who I was. And I said, well, first of all, I, I don't need to leave. I've got social distancing and I'm here representing as the chairman of the board of Cities for Life. We are deemed essential inside the provisions of this ordinance. So you can't tell me to leave. But secondly, even if we weren't considered essential inside the provisions, we're, there's not more than 10 people and we're socially distanced. And uh, so anyway, they said, no, sir, I'm sorry. You're leading a protest. They said to me a couple of times, you're leading a protest. I'm like, no, I'm not. And they said, well, based on how many people are here, we're going to make an arrest. And I said, this, this is a lie. And, and I put it on video. I had my son videoing because I kind of thought something might go down. I'd never been arrested before and I was hoping I wouldn't get arrested. So I told him, I said, well, go to the public park. Why don't you go to Home Depot? There's even more people there or even go to one of these other protests that are running through the streets, but you can't arrest me. Well, they ended up arresting me. And I guess um, I, I can't say the rest is history because thanks, thank God for Alliance Defending Freedom. The rest is going to be history thanks to you guys. Well, thank you so much for standing up for life. Now tell us why it's so important for you to file this lawsuit against the city. Well, I'll tell you, you know, the, Edmund Burke said the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good people to do, to do nothing and good men to do nothing. And, and I felt compelled in my heart, you know, after, as I was being arrested, I mean, my hands were being cuffed behind my back. And like I said, I'd never been arrested before. And I was put into the police car and I was right across from where the police car was. There was one of our sidewalk counselors counseling this mother who chose life and went on to our mobile pregnancy unit, our mobile uh, ultrasound unit and chose life and didn't just choose life for her child. She accepted the Lord into her heart. And, and we had two mothers that day. And so while I was watching this, I was thinking, you know what, if we don't stand up to this, to what's happening to me, then we're not going to have the freedom to be giving life and choices to these mothers. And so I knew right out of the gate, as a matter of fact, while they were taking my mug shot, I was thinking, as soon as I get my cell phone back, I'm calling ADF. I had a couple of the guys, I even had Mike Ferris on, on, on speed dial. And, and I was like, guys, look, here's what went down. And I mean, within minutes, there was a conference call and they looped me in with my dad and my son. And, and because they happened to get arrested the same day, <laughs> just after I went down. So it was so important to us because I feel like we're not going to have these freedoms if we don't fight for them now. And so that's why I said, okay, ADF, let's go. Let's step into this ring and let's win this thing. Wonderful. Well, thank you, David. I do have one last question for you. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people march for life in Washington, D.C. And this year, the theme is Together Strong, Life Unites. And even though this year's march has gone virtual, what message do you have for supporters out there? Well, I'll tell you, you know, now is our time. There's a couple of things. Number one, we don't fight for victory. We fight from it. Uh, the Christ that's inside of us has already won the victory. And what he tells us, he specifically says this, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done unto me. We need to come together as the body of Christ for the least of these. And there's no more least of these than the unborn, the vulnerable unborn. And so we are going to win. We're, you know, we ultimately see in the end that we win uh, in the end times. But right now, we are winning just in our little city of Charlotte. Since we started both Cities for Life and Love Life, uh, almost 5,500 mothers have chosen life. And you know what? They don't just choose life and we leave them alone. We follow up with them. And do you know that's happening all over cities in America? We launched a Love Life initiative uh, that's beginning. The sidewalk missionaries are beginning to go all over the country. And there's various other ministries that are doing the same thing. 
and it is so exciting to watch. So right now we need to unite together and go ahead and just seal this victory and give these mothers who've been robbed, beaten, and left for dead in a ditch, according to Luke chapter 10, we need to give them life affirming solutions. One day Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.